Industry experts from powerhouse brands. Earn Summit, building a community by Tribe Dynamics. And we are live. Great, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Erin Murphy, Senior Research Analyst at Piper Spandler. Uh, thanks for joining me for this session this, this afternoon. I think we've got only 18 minutes. I think for those of you who've been dialing in, it's a pretty short and efficient format. So uh, I'm gonna spend the, the next 18 minutes really talking about uh, a big project that we do at Piper Sandler that really focuses on Gen Z. And so I know for many of you joining us, um, it's been an increasingly important generation to study and to focus. And so I'm gonna walk through um, you know, kind of some of the key highlights from our most recent Taking Stock with Teens report. So just to give a little perspective before we start going through the deck, um, at Piper Sandler, which was formerly Piper Jaffrey, if you're not sure on the name change, um, we've been studying teens since 2001. So we are in our almost 20th year of analyzing the teen demographic. And we speak to teens um, at this point now all online, and we ask them about their shopping preferences, spending behavior, and really just to get to know them better because we strongly believe that they are the next generation to watch and we should all be focused on them um, inherently now. So I'm gonna click through, um, being an investment bank, we have a lot of disclosures. These are investment risks, so just have to flag those. But let's dig into the demographics. So Gen Z, um, there's 67 million Gen Zers here in the United States, according to Pew Research. So roughly 27% of our population is now considered uh, Gen Z. Um, we are the second, or this is the second largest cohort after millennials. Um, and you know, one of the things that we think is so important about this population is they are truly digitally native consumers. And so the team that is answering our survey today, which is an average age of 16, they were four years old when the global financial crisis hit. So earlier today, we've talked a lot about leadership in times of crisis, but they were just four, but they were only three when the first iPhone launched. So that's a really kind of staggering, um, I guess, perspective when you think about, um, you know, they literally came out of the womb just learning how to text and, and be on social platforms. So um, in terms of the most recent survey, we actually just concluded this less than about a month ago. So it's fairly fresh off the press. It was our 39th semi-annual uh, Gen Z report. Um, this season, we spoke to 5,200 teams. So it was a little bit lower than normal. Historically, we get between 8,000 and 10,000 responses. Um, the average age was 16. And you can kind of see on the right-hand side of the screen, um, just the general demographic split um, by region, or excuse me, um, the regional split. So uh, Northeast is a little bit lighter, and we do think it was even lighter this year because of COVID-19. One of the um, one of the key reasons we think our overall response rate was lighter this year was because um, you know we were literally surveying these teams during the pandemic um, onset. So we we started the survey early, or excuse me, mid February, and we concluded at the end of March. So roughly 50% of the responses came in as these teens were taking it from their laptops or from you know kind of their homeschool homeschooling setup so uh, in terms of demographics or um, income demographics 65,000 is the average household income and you'll see in a lot of the reports we put out we often split that um, the survey respondents by upper income versus average income and the upper income is about a quarter of the responses those are households over 100k and typically they tend to be pretty good leading indicators on up-and-coming brands or up-and-coming trends so um, this is just kind of a high level infographic, um, just kind of really spotlighting some of the key notables that came out of this spring survey. Um, but, and we're gonna dig through this, but you'll see a big theme around athletic and comfort and lifestyle uh, from an apparel perspective on the beauty side, while the overall wallet was a lot lower this year than we've seen historically, Ulta did trump that of Sephora. And then in terms of different content, um, Instagram and TikTok kind of top of the list, um, and Netflix and YouTube, and we saw a pretty strong foray of Disney+. Plus. So we're going to dig into the results now. Um, I'd say the first kind of 
high level um, takeaway was spending for this demographic is down. It's down 13%. You can see on this graph, it's effectively been down since 2000, or it's the lowest level, I should say, since 2011. So um, now we think part of that reason, again, this is self-reported. So this is what teens believe they spend. Um, part of that reason, I think, is because we're in a much tougher economic climate. They are like sponges. They're absorbing what their parents are saying, what they're seeing in the media. But also a lot of these teens do have part-time jobs. And we've hosted a lot of focus groups actually on Zoom. And and what's been interesting is, you know, they've seen, you know, some of the ripple effects to the economy by losing their own part-time jobs. So I do think the spending levels are somewhat commensurate, you know, maybe with a broader, with a broader economy. Um, in terms of things that I think are super distinctive, and one of the questions we've uh, on Gen Z, and one of the questions we just started asking um, in the last three surveys is really what they care about. And so the question we started including about a year and a half ago was, what are the most important political or social issues to this demographic? And what's it's super interesting is the environment for all three surveys, I'm only showing two here, is the number one. And it's roughly 16% of the vote um, teens say that they care most about the environment. And interestingly enough, because it was, uh, we hosted this survey or we conducted it during um, February and March, coronavirus, you know, for the first time hit our survey and it's, it's the number two biggest concern. But I think what's really important is this is not, this is an open-ended question. So we scrub all of these results. And just on the right-hand side, I wanted to kind of put a few of the actual responses that get rolled up into this. So fashion's impact on the environment, we would count that as an environment, practicing zero waste. So these are what teens are saying as top of mind for them. And I do think that is, um, should give us all a little glimmer of hope that as we move forward, this, this demographic is one that's going to do great things um, for the world. Um, and so they get really specific. So some of the other questions we asked uh, this demographic was, you know, uh, what are those top environmental concerns? And this was an uh, optional response. So number one, 91% of them did answer it. So I do think that's a positive. Um, but, and they did say they had a specific concern, but you can kind of see it's global warming, pollution waste, you've got um, deforestation. So a number of different um, environmental concerns that they, that they, um, that they cite. Um, what's probably more important is they actually do appear to be not just mindful, but they want to change. So 49% of the respondents said that they have changed their behavior because of this top concern. So whether they're recycling more, whether they're using metal straws, that's been something we've seen in our survey results. Um, what was interesting about this spring, they started talking about driving less or carpooling less, and we hadn't seen that in the prior one. So again, it will be very interesting as we move forward on how this impacts not just what this demographic does and this generation does, but really how brands are kind of developing and evolving. Um, I always like this question. It's kind of the who's who. And I always find myself when we're crunching these results, I have to spend a lot of time Googling and who all of these people are. But we ask who their favorite celebrities are. So it's been interesting. Kevin Hart's been number one for two consecutive years. You see kind of a mix of um, artists as well as actors. Um, Post Malone made a very strong foray onto the first, um, or, or to this list, the top 10 list for the first time, as did Billie Eilish. Um, and then on the social media personalities, um, what's always interesting about this is that their favorite celebrities may not be the top people that they follow on social media. So David Dobrik has been the number one social media star or platform, or um, YouTube star for the last three surveys. Um, you've seen LeBron James, James move up, and then a number of other um, YouTube um, stars as well as um, kind of Instagram uh, personalities as well. So um, this I think is going to be something just interesting to continue to monitor and we do expect it to be it fluctuate um, fairly frequently. Um, so in terms of social media preferences, we kind of divide this question into two different parts. One is what simply what is your favorite social media platform? Um, Snapchat is still number one, Instagram number two. Now, TikTok looks a little misleading in this data, and I'll explain why. This is one piece of the data where we have historically had a drop down list. And so it's not open-ended response. So we only just recently added TikTok. Um, it will be interesting to see post-COVID-19, just given we're hearing about so many um, downloads of that app, if that really starts to skyrocket. But it was number three um, at 13%. 
And then the second, if you look at the left-hand side of the page, this is what platforms they are engaging in most frequently. And so Instagram is the number one, followed by Snapchat and TikTok. Again, I'm very curious to see this when we redo the survey in the fall to see kind of what consumer behavior has shifted. Um, as we move into video consumption, Netflix is number one. It has been for some time, YouTube number two. So this is top preferences of how teens are um, consuming their, their content. And you've seen a very significant trend, and I'm not showing all of our data here, obviously on like cutting cable. Um, and then you've seen some up and coming platforms, whether it's Apple TV, whether it's Disney Plus, that have been kind of rising within this list. So moving on to this, so the sector I most focus on at Piper Sandler, I focus on apparel, footwear, and beauty. And so, um, you know, not surprisingly, and I think this chart, again, fast forward six months will look even more different, is, you know, time spent in different shopping channels. So we have seen kind of a secular long-term trend on teens shopping less in kind of specialty or department store formats, and then obviously more online. So over about 23% of teen spend is done online today. And then again, when we ask what is your favorite shopping website, Amazon has been number one for quite some time. But I think that the share is staggering. If you just think about the number two Nike is a tenth of the share of number one Amazon and really just speaks to the power of that platform, the convenience it has. You know, clearly it's not for everyone, but the eyeballs on that platform are substantial. Um, one of the things that we've done as a research platform is we've been studying a lot about some of the channel migration we just talked about. And we estimate that Amazon, even in soft lines where a lot of brands are still hesitant on, do they use that platform, do they not? Um, you know, it's 80% of the incremental dollar growth in soft lines apparel. If you think about a $300 billion um, industry here in North America. So it's pretty staggering the volume that they have been generating even within soft lines. Um, in terms of kind of where clothing fits as a priority within the wallet, um, it is top of mind for females. So it's still just over a quarter of the female wallet or her budget. It's the number two preference for males. So I don't know what that says. I guess men think with their stomach, but food is number one, 25% of the male wallet, um, but also 25% of the female. So you've seen a very significant trend towards food. We think that has actually been um, you know, kind of part and parcel with this theme of experience. For teens, food is, is not about necessarily buying groceries, but really about finding spaces um, to socialize with their friends. And so we've seen, you know, Chick-fil-A is the number one restaurant, Starbucks is the number two, and that's been kind of a compounding trend in the data for a decade now. Um, video games, top of mind for males, and that has continued. It's now at peak share in terms of how much they're spending on video games. And then uh, personal care, number uh, three for, for females. And we're going to talk a little bit more about what's been happening in beauty and personal care because that has been somewhat of a lackluster trend um, for, you know, for a period of time now within the female cohort. Um, but before we do, let's talk a little bit more about apparel. Um, we have seen the athletic trend really strong in our data. So this chart is really aggregating the upper income teens and just the share of, um, I guess, the mind share of them saying, naming an athletic brand as their top brand. And so 37% of all teens um, do say an athletic brand is their favorite brand. So Nike is number one on that list. We'll go through that list shortly. And then looking at footwear, and I think this is fascinating because this is specific to females. The chart's a little less exciting with males. It basically is just at 80% and pretty high up. Um, but what you've seen going back to 2005, back in 05, there was just over 20% of females indicated that their top footwear brand was an athletic brand. And I'm just using kind of a subset of these six brands here. Today, that number is 78%. So it's strong trend towards comfort, strong trend towards athletic. And we do believe, you know, coming out of COVID as well, that is going to be a behavior that is, that remains fairly sticky. 
Um, so let's dig deeper into the brands. Um, what's interesting is if we just look at the number one brand in 2001, which was the first year that we started our survey, Gap was the number one brand. Today, it's not even in the top 30. So teens are not, have moved far from Gap. They moved through the Abercrombie phase, the Hollister phase. There was a period of time where action sports, whether it was Zoomies or Diamond Supply Co., top of mind. And now we've been on almost a decade-long trend of Nike. So you can see here... Um, on, on the results, Nike is the number one brand for teens at a quarter of the teen demographic. What's really interesting though is American Eagle has been an incredibly consistent performer in our data. Going back through all 39 surveys, American Eagle has never been the number one, but it's never fallen out of the top five. So it's been the most consistent of what we would say the traditional teen apparel, um, you know, kind of of that subset. Lululemon, another one I think is important to highlight, um, kind of part and parcel with that athletic theme. It's been a very strong mover in our data. It was not even in the top 10 a year and a half ago, and now it's number six. Um, with footwear, not a lot of surprises here. Nike is number one. Almost half of all teens say that. Vans has been number two and been a very strong um, grower within the data. Um, I know we don't have a ton of time, so I'm going to fire off the next few slides fairly quickly, but um, these are just top trends that teens are talking about. A few things I think are relevant, maybe focusing on the second chart with females. You've got Visco, that whole Visco girl trend. It's still there, but not as strong as it was in the fall. But really, this is all about athletic and comfort and casualization. And you can see that displayed by both the male and the female preference for top, top trends. Um, and so let's move to beauty. That has been, um, you know, a piece of the wallet for females, which is the third most important piece, but it has been declining. And so um, we kind of dig into, you know, the whys, but where you've seen the biggest decrease is the cosmetic spend. It's down 26% year over year. And, you know, skincare was down, fragrance is kind of flattish, slightly down. But, you know, we think um, kind of the biggest reason why, and I think I'll tick through this, is, is a behavioral shift. You're seeing more dollars move um, collectively across the, the space into skincare, but a more natural move of, of, among females kind of emerge, so, or a more natural trend. So consumers choosing to buy fewer items instead of this over, over kind of done multi-unit kind of um, product trend look. And so I do think this is something will be interesting to observe as we come out of COVID, what are some of those beauty um, habit changes? But in terms of shopping destination, unlike apparel and footwear, specialty retail really does matter. So Ulta and Sephora are the top of the list. You've seen for three consecutive surveys that Ulta has elapsed or eclipsed that of Sephora share. So it's about 40% share of teens say Ulta is their number one um, destination. The only other thing I'll point out here is you're starting to see a lot of digital peer play in this list. So Amazon, number five, uh, Morphe, which clearly sells into Ulta as well, but it started as a DTC brand. That is in the top 10, Glossier in the top 10. So something to be mindful of going forward. Um, I'm gonna click through these next slides because I don't have a tremendous amount of time left. But in terms of, um, in terms of, um, I wanted to focus on clean beauty. So I, and for those who want this slide presentation, I'll leave my email at the end. Um, but clean beauty, and this really, I do think goes part and parcel with the environment, which is top of mind for teens that we've talked about, has been a big theme. And it's interesting because if you, if you go back and look at the brands that teens list, they don't actually name a clean beauty brand in the top 10 for at least the cosmetics. But 53% of teens say they do look at the ingredients in their beauty or personal care products. And that's up from 47% just six months ago. And 75%, so for all that are listening that are developing brands or brand owners, 75% do say that they're willing to spend more for clean beauty or for natural beauty. And so that was very similar to the fall. And then when we asked, well, how much more would you pay? It's 30% uh, more. So that will be interesting to see as some of these smaller clean beauty brands are evolving, how, um, how that looks going forward in the landscape. And then just the last thing I'll say, and I'll have to end after this slide, is um, the, in the world of influencers, and I know there's been a lot of conversation of that this morning and this afternoon on these sessions, but is very important for beauty. So 78% of females use online beauty influencers or cite online beauty influencers as their number one way to 
connect with the brand or to learn about a brand. And so you can kind of see the multi-survey trend here, but influencers top of mind and friends kind of the second, um, kind of second most important uh, source of discovery. And we're at time. So I really thank you all for tuning in. Um, if you did have questions, feel free to email me directly. My email is Erin, E-R-I-N-N dot Murphy, M-U-R-P-H-Y at psc.com and or you can talk to connor he knows me well and he can get a hold of me but i'm happy to share these slides or our bigger report if that's of interest to you so thank you again for tuning in and i hope you guys have a wonderful afternoon thank you